Um, I'll be uh, speaking in English today. I hope that works all right. Um, so as Zinni mentioned, I work for the World Wide Web Consortium and um, specifically in the Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, I work on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and the Protocols and Formats Working Group, which is responsible for uh, much of the other uh, accessibility review work that we do. And I work on the HTML Accessibility Task Force. So this morning I'd like to uh, talk about uh, how the World Wide Web Consortium develops uh, standards and how we support accessibility and how you can be involved in that. So I'll give a brief introduction to what the organization is. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the organization, uh, but I'd like to provide uh, a few more details about how the organization works. And then uh, describe how we develop technologies, what we're doing currently with accessibility, what our future plans are for accessibility, and then how you can be involved. So to introduce the organization, uh, World Wide Web Consortium is founded by Tim Berners-Lee, who is known as the inventor of the web. Uh, the, it's structured as a consortium. Uh, a consortium is a group of companies that come together to work for a common purpose. So uh, formally, the, the World Wide Web Consortium is, uh, is a group of companies. It's managed by team, is what we call the, the people who work directly for the consortium. So I'm a member of the team. I work directly for the consortium, not for one of the member companies. Um, the member companies direct the work of the consortium through what we call the advisory committee. Um, so the consortium exists to create standards which support interoperability. The philosophy is that uh, interoperability makes a more robust uh, technological ecosystem. Basically, uh, if we all have the same standards for the web, then we can all implement to them and we all have a stronger interoperable web. Um, whereas, uh, you know, proprietary technologies, by contrast, while they can be very good for one company, are less good for the web as a whole. So the uh, W3C uh, seeks uh, uh, interoperability for one web. Another important aspect of this is that the standards are royalty free, meaning that you don't have to pay anybody to implement the standards. Anybody can implement the standards. A large company, a, a kid working in their basement, anybody can implement the standards and this allows for the maximum amount of creativity and innovation. Uh, there's a very detailed process uh, that ensures fairness uh, and guides the work of the W3C. If any of you have worked with us and have been uh, frustrated by the slowness of the work that sometimes happens, um, that's because of this process that's in in intended to ensure fairness and transparency, is intended to make, the, uh, ma make this work for everybody involved. Another very important role of the W3C is to provide stewardship. So the, the consortium uh, makes sure that as the web evolves, we uh, pay attention to issues such as accessibility, architecture, device independence, internationalization, privacy, security. Of course, I'm here to talk about accessibility. These are all issues that can easily be overlooked when new technologies are created. So having a formal role to look after those technologies helps to make sure that uh, the web is, is good with respect to each of those issues. So to provide stewardship for accessibility, we have the Web Accessibility Initiative. The Web Accessibility Initiative uh, creates guidelines for accessibility. Probably most of you are familiar with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines which define how you should author content to make it accessible. Uh, we provide other sets of guidelines as well. Additionally, we review technologies. The World Wide Web Consortium has more than 100 technologies, um, each one of which needs to be uh, reviewed for accessibility. Uh, many of them have accessibility implications, could pose accessibility barriers if we didn't review and, and make sure that they had accessibility designed into them from the start. Another important aspect is the education and outreach. We focus 
on educating the public at large about how to implement accessibility and of course on how to on we focus on implementers and make sure that they understand the importance of accessibility um, and then we also do a small amount of research and development to uh, further our knowledge of accessibility and bring that to future accessibility work. The, the Web Accessibility Initiative's guidelines, particularly the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, are widely referenced. Uh, many countries have passed national accessibility laws that reference Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. Um, many corporations also have incorporated requirements for accessibility and they use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. So uh, this is one way that we ensure that accessibility has one meaning, one implementation worldwide. Um, and it's a big success for the uh, Web Accessibility Initiative. There are authorized translations of uh, many of our resources, particularly Web Content Accessibility Guidelines has been translated into, I think, at least 10 languages, um, and at least another 10 are in the works as well. Um, so uh, we're very interested in worldwide ad adoption of the guidelines. So I want to talk about uh, how we work briefly. Uh, some of you may have been involved in W3C uh, in, in some capacity or another, or you may have simply observed the work uh, but not understood why we do what we do. So I want to explain that briefly. So, as I mentioned, it's a consortium composed of member organizations. Uh, we have more than 400 organizations that are members of the consortium, um, and they pay to be a member, which supports the work of the consortium. Uh, the benefit for their payment is that they have a direct involvement in the specification. Um, and in general, uh, one should be a member organization to participate in the work. However, uh, of course, there are uh, organizations that are too small to be able to afford to uh, participate, and there are also people who work as independent consultants or who work for uh, academic environments who have a great deal of relevant expertise but don't uh, uh, have the ability to pay a member fee. So we do have a process for what we call invited experts. Um, so invited experts do not represent a specific organization. They're invited based on the knowledge that they have uh, and uh, they're able to participate uh, at the same level as other member organizations. So um, although there is uh, a membership requirement in general, it's not an absolute requirement and it doesn't exclude participation of other people. Whether you come in representing uh, a member organization or yourself, as an invited expert, you do take on uh, patent obligations by joining the W3C. The goal is that no specification is encumbered by patents. There are no patents that force uh, people to, to pay to, to implement the specification. So uh, when you join the organization, you commit to not putting patented information into the specification. You, you keep a, uh, all, the, all the work that is developed when you work with the W3C is shared by all and isn't patented. If you do have a patent, um, there's, a, there's a process for basically licensing the patent to the world in what's called a reasonable and non-discriminatory uh, uh, way. So when you're involved in the world, in the W3C, uh, most of the work is done in what we call working groups. Uh, working groups will have at least one staff person like myself involved to help coordinate the work and there will be a chair or sometimes co-chairs who uh, manage the overall work of the group. Everybody else is a member representative or an invited expert and the group comes together to do the work that is chartered to do. Uh, this uh, is usually done in teleconferences, it's often done in email, it's sometimes done in uh, chat and uh, often nowadays wiki as well. There are many ways that the work is done but basically everybody comes together to work. Um, and with a working group there's usually a specific outcome that it's supposed to produce, a specific technology, a specific standard. We also have interest groups uh, which aren't focused on producing specific uh, technologies. Uh, but they are ways for people to come together uh, and discuss issues that are relevant to the particular focus of the interest group. For instance, we have a WAY interest group, Web Accessibility Initiative interest group. Um, so people can discuss general issues of web accessibility. 
and uh, the discussions on interest groups may well inform uh, some of the work that working groups will take up. Uh, because many of the technologies work together, we also have coordination groups uh, that uh, formally organize coordination between people working on different topics. Um, for instance, so there's a hypertext coordination group that coordinates HTML and SVG um, and uh, formerly XHTML, um, you know, we bring accessibility into that. So we bring all of the stakeholders together in one place and make sure that we're coordinating our work appropriately. We also have a new uh, facility called community and business groups. Uh, these are ways for members uh, of the public, basically anybody can form a community or a business group uh, to, uh, to work out an idea. Um, a business group might be focused on initial exploration of a technology. A community group could be focused on anything. It might be wanting to explore a particular problem that's relevant to web accessibility. Um, you can form these groups, work on them. Um, there's minimal obligations for participation. You don't have to be an invited expert or a member representative to participate in these. Um, ultimately, these groups would produce uh, outcomes that might be taken up by the W3C as a formal standard, or they might not. But there, it's a new opportunity for uh, people uh, in the general public to participate in uh, W3C. So the role of people like myself who are uh, on the team is to primarily oversee that working groups adhere to the, the process that I, I mentioned before. Um, so, it, you know, as a working group does its work, we, we don't want any sort of bias um, or, or unfairness to creep in, so uh, we make sure that uh, the process document and all of the steps are followed. Um, that's uh, uh, both a, a managerial task and an administrative task. Um, there's a lot of process involved in, in doing a publication of a specification. Mm -hmm. Um, team members generally also provide uh, technical leadership, so uh, team uh, uh, are expected to know about the technology that the, the group is working on. They may not be the world's foremost, foremost expert, uh, sometimes they are, uh, often they aren't, uh, but they, they help guide the direction of the technology. Um, and also team members work with each other to make sure, again, that the work is coordinated with the uh, larger organization. Um, and then we are able to support the, the basic work of the working group as well. When groups work, uh, they follow what we call the consensus process. Uh, consensus means that in principle, everyone in the group should agree to the decision that was made. Um, not just everyone in the group, ultimately you want consensus of the world. Um, that can be a challenging process. Um, it can require lengthy discussion uh, to discuss all the angles. Um, when, when discussing a, a difficult topic, uh, at, at first it may seem like the answer is clear, uh, but then as the work progresses, uh, the, uh, the different issues come up, uh, minority viewpoints, uh, you know, perspectives from uh, other regions of the world, um, you know, of course, different business interests, they all come up and uh, they need to be discussed, uh, the implications of each worked out uh, until a consensus is achieved. This does require a level of maturity. Uh, we have a requirement called for participation that you have to be socially competent in your role. Um, so you, you have to have the ability to work in good faith towards consensus. Um, and, and that is a participation requirement. I bring that up because many of you have probably heard about some of the difficulties working with HTML, uh, HTML5, um, uh, and uh, I won't be speaking about that because John is uh, speaking about HTML later, um, but uh, we use social competence in one's role as a, as a way of measuring, you know, is a person's uh, uh, contribution productive? Uh, we are seeking consensus, not voting. The reason for this is that standards supported by consensus rather than simply winner takes all voting is they're more likely to be implemented. If there isn't consensus, people may well not implement the standard and then there's no point to it. So this does make the standards process slow um, and if you've been uh, observing the work of the W3C, you may have wondered why it's so slow. 
the consensus uh, process is slower than other development processes. Um, but we believe it's necessary for the robustness of our standards. Uh, there is the ability to resort to a vote, um, but it's used as a last resort. Uh, it's not uh, often used in W3C in most working groups uh, because we value consensus so highly. As we work on the technology, uh, there's a number of stages to developing the technology. Um, first of all, you, uh, you publish a, what we call a first public working draft. Uh, so the first public working draft is the first draft of the technology. It may be fairly mature um, or it may be uh, very much a draft, um, putting some ideas out there. There has by that time already been you know, a fair amount of discussion, requirements gathering. You know, the, the need for the technology is clear. The first public working draft is the first skeleton of what the technology actually is. After that, uh, a group will publish any number of working drafts. Um, in th principle, it should publish a working draft at least every three months. These working drafts give opportunities to the public and other working groups to review the, the technology and provide input. Um, so it's an important part of the, uh, the openness uh, is ensuring that there are multiple working drafts being published uh, on a fairly frequent basis and receiving feedback. Um, many working groups also publish editor's drafts that are uh, less formal and therefore can be updated more rapidly, um, but the formal public working drafts are a very important part of the process as well. When the group thinks it's completed its work, it publishes what's called a last call working draft. Last call means last call for comments. Um, it believes that uh, the work is complete. We basically say to the world, if there are any comments, give, us to a, give them to us now. Um, and the group will process those comments. Um, sometimes after a last call, it, it uh, needs to make so many changes that it has to go back to the working draft stage, incorporate the changes, and recycle through. And that's what the diagram on the right uh, demonstrates. You can always bounce back to a previous stage as well. Um, if, if needed, um, but, and then re-advance. Um, once uh, you have a last call working draft that is stable and, and is not significantly changed as a result of comments, you can proceed to candidate recommendation. Uh, at this point, uh, we seek implementation. Uh, in order for a, a technology to become a W3C standard, um, it has to be what we believe is implementable. Um, so a candidate recommendation needs test implementations. Uh, we require at least two implementations of every feature of the technology. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be two complete implementations of the technology. It just has to be two implementations of each feature. Um, but it's a way of testing that there aren't unimplementable features in the technology. Um, it's actually surprising how many times something that seemed perfectly fine in the working draft stage turns out to be difficult in practice when taken to the implementation stage. So this is another important stage uh, in, the, in the specification development process. And again, it's possible for a specification to discover it had an unimplementable feature and bounce back to working draft to resolve the problem. Ultimately, the, the specification can advance past candidate recommendation to proposed recommendation where the membership of the uh, W3C takes a vote and decides whether to accept the technology. And then finally it becomes a formal recommendation which is a, a standard that anybody can implement. It's stable so that uh, you can expect that the technology won't change. All the implementations of that standard will be interoperable with each other. Um, I've talked a few times about the importance of public comments. Um, it's possible uh, for um, people to comment on a working draft at any time, or, well, they can comment on any W3C specification at any stage of maturity at any time. Um, and there are instructions for that in any document. Um, uh, there is a status of this document section. Um, uh, let's see if I can... I have an example on the screen, uh, so uh, I'm not used to the mouse on a Mac. 
So uh, the status of this document section uh, is towards the top of any specification. It has a bunch of boilerplate information that's pretty boring to read. People skip over it a lot. Um, but uh, there are comments, uh, there's always instructions for commenting. Uh, especially with a last call working draft, there will be a due date because the working group is seeking to progress its work on a timetable. So it will give a, uh, a comment review period of at least three weeks and often more for people to, to make comments and then the working group will formally process and track the comments. So the instructions are always somewhere in that status of this document section. Um, the comments are, are most useful on working drafts and are most critical on last call working drafts. Um, so uh, when you hear of a last call working draft of a, of a specification that's important to you, that would be the time to make comments. It's very helpful to provide comments before the specification reaches last call, um, uh, but in reality that often doesn't happen. So any working draft, including a last call working draft, is a good one to make comments on. Um, because some specifications receive a large number of comments um, and they relate to each other, uh, several people may comment on the same feature and they may all say the same thing or they may all say contradictory things that the working group has to make a decision about. Um, the group has to wait to receive all the comments and process them together. Um, so it can take time to process comments and that's another uh, I think frustrating aspect of the process from the outside is I send in my comment, why haven't I heard anything back? Um, the group is processing the comment, uh, but it can take, it has been known to take months, uh, many months sometimes to process comments. We're working on improving uh, the, the speed and the transparency of comment processing, but that is one aspect of the process. Um, ultimately, when the group has finished processing comments, it will send an acknowledgement to the commenter. Um, and uh, it, with, a, it, with a, 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 a disposition of the comment, we'll say whether we accepted uh, the comment or did not accept it. Um, sometimes we say we did something else. We, we took the spirit of your comment, but we didn't take the exact proposal you made. So whatever the response is, we'll send that back to you. And then uh, request an acknowledgement of whether you can accept that disposition or not. Um, that's important because if, if you, after, reviewing the working group feedback, you still have a problem. You do have, do have the opportunity to say, I still think this is a problem. Um, or you may say, okay, I understand where you're coming from, I can accept this. Um, and that disposition is important because we want to know that, uh, that, that the, the specification as, as modified through the comments process um, is acceptable. Um, and uh, if commenters do not accept the disposition, those are reviewed before the document uh, goes to the candidate recommendation. They're reviewed um, by the director, um, which is um, Tim Berners-Lee or somebody he delegates to review it. So it takes, it's a very formal process, again, to make sure that uh, a commenter, just because they disagree with the working group, aren't completely ignored. They're, it's basically an escalation process they have. Okay, so how, how do we make sure that uh, accessibility is part of W3C technologies? Um, the Protocols and Formats Working Group, uh, which I'm a team contact in, uh, is the group in the Web Accessibility Initiative that reviews any W3C technology and looks for accessibility problems. Um, so we provide information uh, about how to make uh, technologies accessible um, and we work with the, with the developers of those technologies. So um, any time a new technology is being published, the Protocols and Formats Working Group has looked at it. Um, some technologies um, are very low level. Uh, they're about parsing or, or network transmission, um, and they don't have many accessibility implications, um, although we have discovered accessibility issues even in such technologies. But many technologies affect user interface, and some of those are the most important W3C technologies. So uh, we make careful review of those um, and, and strive to make sure that accessibility features are built into the specification. Um, doing this doesn't mean that all implementations of the technology will be accessible. HTML has a lot of accessibility features, but authors still have to use them. Um, but uh, we do make sure that the specification provides the accessibility features. Um, uh, we also create specifications to fill gaps. 
Um, many of you have probably heard of ARIA, which is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. Um, this is a technology the Protocols and Formats Group uh, created to fill in gaps in HTML4 uh, because uh, of dynamic content, rich internet applications um, using script and CSS, AJAX, you know, dynamic content. They were creating many types of new widgets, many, many new kinds of interaction that it was simply not possible to make accessible in HTML4. So ARIA um, provides a way of making that accessible, and ARIA is being integrated into HTML5 um, in addition to other accessibility features that we're working on. Um, and of course, we coordinate with the accessibility industry as at large to uh, make sure that the accessibility solutions we build into the web are, are, are workable. So current work that we're doing um, the major specifications that the Web Accessibility Initiative have is ARIA, as I've just mentioned. Um, we also now have, in, in last call, the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines and the User Agent Accessibility Guidelines. Um, these uh, define, respectively, how authoring tools, uh, whether that be a desktop authoring tool or a content management system, any tool that creates web content needs to, of course, create accessible web content and support the author in doing so. And it needs to have an accessible user interface so that a person can use the authoring tool. So the authoring tool accessibility guidelines speak to that. User agent accessibility guidelines are about browsers. Uh, both mainstream browsers and assistive technologies and say what they need to do in order to make sure that accessible content is rendered in an accessible manner to the user. Um, and then the web content accessibility guidelines uh, which uh, instructs what accessible content should look like. Um, so these technologies um, all work together uh, to create an accessible web. Um, and they all have uh, supporting material primers, implementation guidance, techniques. Um, you know, each of them has a very large amount of implementation guidance. Um, some of it is uh, in technicalese, shall I say. It's, it's very technical. Um, we're working on making more user-friendly uh, versions of it, but there is a lot of implementation information available for each of these sets of guidelines. Um, I talked about the technology review that the Protocols and Formats Working Group does. That's one of our very important tasks. Um, we, uh, every month, uh, look at a number of new technologies. Um, in the past year, um, web applications and uh, cascading style sheets have been very important priorities for us. Um, uh, issues that bring lots of new accessibility concerns. Uh, web applications is a suite of specifications for uh, dynamic web content, and CSS um, is being you know, greatly upgraded to provide a, a large number of new user interface features, um, which are great but uh, need careful attention to accessibility considerations. So we're taking a close look at uh, those technologies. And then, of course, HTML5. Uh, is such a big issue that we created a separate task force. Um, it's formally a project of the uh, Protocols and Formats Working Group and the HTML Working Group, uh, but it, the work is conducted separately. And that group has been uh, active for about two years now on reviewing HTML5 um, and has uh, submitted a, a large number of comments and design guidance to the HTML Working Group and continues to uh, work on accessibility of HTML5. We have recently created a research and development working group. Uh, uh, one of the uh, challenges with much of the W3C's accessibility guidance is that it's based on individual expertise and anecdotal evidence. There isn't a lot of formal research that supports the uh, uh, the accessibility uh, knowledge of the W3C. Um, uh, so, you know, we believe that uh, the expertise that exists in the Web Accessibility Initiative is uh, very, uh, you, know, you know, very good, uh, but it still is good to have, uh, uh, you know, research-backed uh, accessibility guidance and, of course, to research the accessibility issues of new technologies. 
Um, so, you know, the, the web continues to evolve, technology continues to evolve, new types of accessibility uh, challenges continue to be created. So we've created a research and development working group that will be working on these. This group is not able to do um, all the research that is needed, but it hopes to coordinate uh, and identify research priorities and stimulate research in, uh, in the field in, as a whole. Um, the Web Accessibility Initiative also has in-reach and outreach programs to reach out to the public to educate about the importance of accessibility and how to do accessibility practically. And then in-reach, which is reaching out to other working groups um, and supporting them in how to make technology accessible. So, with all that background, you know, what are we going to be doing in the future? We've done a lot so far. Um, we're almost complete with our four sets of guidelines. Um, there are a number of tasks ahead of us. Um, one is to work on new technologies. Uh, we've already created ARIA uh, to solve some of the problems in HTML4. Uh, we're now beginning work on a, a technology tentatively titled Independent User Interface for Rich Internet Applications. Um, this solves the problem of accessibility on touch devices, basically. Um, at the moment, there, uh, there's a, a greater and greater use of devices that use touch for input, uh, you know, smartphones and tablets and whatnot. Um, the, the touch events, the, when, when you touch the screen and move your, your finger, a series of touch events are sent to the web application that, uh, that have meaning, but uh, it's very hard for uh, a, a, an application or an assistive technology to interpret that meaning without, meaning without uh, mediation from the device. Um, so, you know, there are gestures that, that have particular meanings, uh, but they need to send an accessible event. So we're working on specifying a series of accessible events, such as a scroll event, uh, a page turn event, a click event that was done by touch, etc. Um, so uh, this will be a sort of an abstraction layer between the device-specific touch events and the web application that will uh, greatly improve accessibility of touch-based web applications. Another important uh, use case is so that assistive technology, um, if you're using a touch-capable application but not using a touch device, you're using a different form of assistive technology, the technology can send the event to you, to the, to the web application, um, so again, it doesn't have to simulate touch events, it can send the appropriate information. So this will be an important new technology coming out of the Web Accessibility Initiative soon. Uh, we're also uh, planning to work with the Web Applications Working Group on a replacement for DOM3 events. This is getting a bit technical, but um, events are uh, uh, ways web applications know that something has happened, and some of the events that are needed for accessible rich internet applications have been removed. Um, so uh, we're working on a, on a replacement that solves some of the problems with those. And, uh, and then the activate event is another one um, for, uh, which uh, uh, the activate event is an abstract event for saying I want to click this button, follow this link, etc. Um, currently, you can only do that using click events, which is a mouse-specific event. So we're working on a, a general activate event. We also have a document about the inaccessibility of CAPTCHA, which was published many years ago. And uh, so we are uh, wanting to update that document. Uh, CAPTCHA continues to be an arms race between humans and machines. And unfortunately, efforts to address the arms race continue to create accessibility problems. So this is a document that needs to be updated. Um, and then uh, with our existing specifications, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, User Agent Accessibility Guidelines, even though they will shortly be final, we continue to need to maintain the supporting materials. Um, you don't maintain the, the specification itself, but the techniques, the understanding information, all of that needs to be maintained. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Working Group has been publishing new sets of techniques every year or so. Um, and we're wanting to continue to maintain the understanding information. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done just on maintaining that supporting information to support the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, c continued relevance of those technologies. 
There's also new technologies coming at us all the time, uh, which we have to respond to and create accessibility solutions for. Um, at the moment, I see geolocation, uh, uh, privacy, security, uh, as, as major new issues that are going to bring both accessibility benefits and accessibility challenges. So we need to start tracking these technologies and figure out how to solve them. And then um, accessibility, or APIs, application programming interfaces, um, th these are becoming more and more widely used. The web is becoming less and less declarative and, and using more and more script APIs. So we need to make sure that there are accessibility features in those APIs. Um, as far as future guidelines work, uh, we're a little bit less sure uh, about what needs to be done. We, the the 2.0 guidelines were designed to be relevant for a, a stable period of time. Um, so we're not in the short term planning on updating those technologies. Um, I do see the need for uh, what I'm calling right now content technology accessibility guidelines to describe the accessibility features that a specification such as HTML or SVG should provide um, and uh, recommend ways to incorporate them. Because right now the, that, that knowledge is uh, carried only amongst the people who happen to work in the working group. There's not a lot of documentation of this kind of knowledge. So um, I think content technology accessibility guidelines will be an important new specification from the way to support uh, accessible web technology. Uh, eventually, we probably will need to update the 2.0 guidelines, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, Authoring Tool, User Agent. Um, we think that we would probably want to do it in a less modular way, um, less separated. They're more interactive. The, the issues of these kind of tools relate to each other more than they used to. So there will probably be a new structure for how these guidelines uh, are, are organized, uh, but we're right now waiting for the 2.0 versions to be complete. So, um, how you can be involved. Um, there are various communities of knowledge that we should be taking advantage of. People have various viewpoints on what the accessibility challenges are and various solutions for them, and also various requirements. Different companies have different requirements that uh, they have to interface with the accessibility requirements. Um, groups such as user interface designers, graphic designers, tool implementers, assistive technology developers, large site developers, small site developers, all of these groups have their own sets of knowledge and their own sets of requirements. Um, and what I think we need to do is bring these groups together. Um, yeah, the, the knowledge is a bit uh, isolated right now, so what you can do is be involved in, in out reaching out to other uh, companies and other organizations and, you know, of course come to W3C and bring your own knowledge because uh, I want to see us bringing knowledge together. You can participate via public reviews. Um, uh, public feedback is a very important part of the process. Um, as I mentioned before, you can comment at any time. Uh, if you're interested in accessibility specifications, you can join the Way Interest Group, which will always have announcements about reviews. Um, you can also check the W3C homepage or follow the Twitter feed um, to see new re review opportunities so that you can get review comments in in a timely manner. And of course you can join groups. If you work for a organization that's a, that is or could be a W3C member, you can join as a member. Otherwise you can explore the possibility of joining as an invited expert. Um, uh, there's. Uh, definitely a need to have more people involved and, and more points of view respect, re represented in these working groups. So I, I would like to invite anybody here to consider joining some of our working groups. Also, um, I would uh, encourage you to take advantage of the community and business groups uh, that we've uh, now offered. It's very easy to form one of these groups. Um, you, you basically make a proposal for a group and if it gets enough votes from the public of interest, then the group can form. Um, this is a way of, uh, of working on a particular topic with some of the infrastructure that W3C offers, but without some of the, um, the process uh, uh, holdups that, that are associated with some more formal work. And it's a great way to uh, experiment uh, uh, with, uh, with technologies and bring a lot of knowledge in. I can see uh, a lot of potential for community groups, especially in the accessibility area, and particularly the people who are here in this audience, um, I think, might have a common interest 
uh, uh, you know, and uh, you know, a group, some of the organizations here, some of the sponsoring organizations might well be good candidates for f forming a community group around you know, Quebec web accessibility or around you know, French web accessibility. Um, <laughs> Um, or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's many different ideas I think that could be come up with. Um, so I, I really see a lot of opportunity for people here to be involved in some of that work. Um, also, uh, those of you with uh, organizations that work on specific topics may want to have a more formal liaison with W3C. So consider if uh, you might want to formalize a liaison with us. So I'm sorry to rush through the end, but thank you very much for your attention.